Hello, beautiful people. I am very, very happy to have Ms. Su Sumi here with us. She agreed to do a second interview, shocker. So <laughs> thank you very much for this. Oh, I you. had such a great time last time. My own channel format is very scheduled and regimented, and I don't have the opportunity to just go on and explore all the nooks and crannies of a situation and the back and forth that we get, the questions, the, the things that might not be foremost in my mind that you bring up is terrific. So oh, I love this. This is just we we get to dig into things. Thanks, and 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 I, some people were upset because I interrupt you. Sometimes it's because I have a question, and, and the thing is, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's age. You know how some people are able to take a mental note and say, "I'm going to ask this later," but then um, I don't know. Then I forget. I have such a short attention span. I forget. Anyway, I get on to the next thing that I've forgotten what I was going to ask. So no, don't feel bad about that at all. Part of what I love about this. Is the back and forth when, because I know what's interesting to me. Okay. I know what I think is important, but knowing what other people are interested in and what other people think is important is that's part of this so that we can produce a full picture. Yeah. And also because I always like to learn uh, things. So when I hear other people's perspectives, you know, they always bring because, you know, I am 55 and, you know, I have my idea of things, but I always like learning new stuff or people's perspectives. So thank you very much. And do please tell me what you what, what you want to do the video today about what the theme of the video is about today. Diana and her life and how it impacted her sons, uh, not just Diana as a mother and the impact that had, but Diana as a wife and how that impacted her boys, Diana as a daughter and how that impacted her boys. Because we look at Diana and think the kids were barely into their teens when she passed. So how could this have been a massive impact? Well, I think it was. So we're going to dig into that. So let's get into this. Uh, how do you want to start? When do you want to, you sent me some pictures. Is there one that you would like me to pull out in particular? Um, any one of the early pictures of Diana. These are all Diana. When she was Lady Diana Spencer. When she and Charles would have been dating. Uh, when they would have been engaged. In fact, I think that might be uh, from the engagement pictures that they did. Uh, this is who Charles proposed to. This is a 19-year-old girl. We can't lose sight of that. A 19-year-old girl raised in the British aristocracy, very sheltered, with virtually no education. Uh, Diana flunked out of high school. <laughs> she, Yeah, it's not like she dropped out. She flunked out. Yeah. She admitted um, that though. She she used to mock herself about it. She knows. She would say, she would say, I'm thick as a plank. And the problem is, she wasn't that far off. <laughs> uh, she got one A level, which correspondingly in the US, you wouldn't have graduated high school with that. That's I don't think you would have graduated high school in the UK either. But this is a dismal performance. So she never went back. She went to a finishing school in Switzerland, but only did one term there. So she didn't even complete that course. She had nothing uh, going for her that would have equipped her to deal with Charles, who was a man. Uh, now, I've said this before, I'll say it again intellectually that family peaked out in the 16th century downhill from there so charles nasa is not looking for this guy <laughs> but he was very well educated so you know despite the fact that he doesn't have a lot of well he certainly doesn't have the native intelligence that his tutor forebears had but still head and shoulders above Diana. 
given the fact that he was 13 years older, he had all of this education, he had a superior rank in society, a superior fortune, everybody would have been telling Diana that she caught the brass ring. There's no question that there was a complete power imbalance in this relationship. So I want to ask you something. Sorry, sir. No, I want to no. ask my apologies. But Charles, in the in, in the engagement interview, he stated that he put her set her, her his eyes on her at the age of sixteen. That was the first time they met, but it was a brief meeting. Charles dated her older sister, and Diana. It was like a meeting, and then he later reacquainted himself with her when she had just turned 19. And this would have been in 1980. No, yeah, she had just turned 19, 1980. So that's right, because she was born in 61. And it was that summer, so she was barely 19. And that's when he decided she was a prospective bride. The reason he decided she was a prospective bride is because uh, Louis Mountbatten, Lord Mountbatten, his beloved great uncle, and this was Philip's uncle, had told him, and keep in mind, Mountbatten's miserable marriage was the stuff of legend. So this is no one to go to for marital advice. Mountbatten told Charles, to sow his wild oats. And then when he got to be around 30, and remember, this is Charles's age, when they married, he should go off and find himself a young, innocent girl from the aristocracy. What Mountbatten had in mind was his own granddaughter, Amanda Natchbull. Now, Amanda was, I think, a year or two younger than Diana. In any event, Charles actually did attempt to court Amanda, but Amanda's mother refused and said, not happening, she's too young. Amanda herself declined as well. So he still had this template in his head that he needed to go off and find a girl, barely an adult, from the aristocracy and marry her. Charles was if nothing else, a very dutiful nephew to Mountbatten. He, he really worshipped the guy and took everything he said as gospel. So Amanda's out of the picture. By the way, obviously it was a smart move on Amanda's part. So I think we need to give her some, some applause <laughs> or, well, she didn't want what she would have been buying into. And she knew the family better. Diana. One question. Well, sorry sure. to interrupt. Did Charles already, was he already seeing Camilla? Oh, yes. He had been seeing Camilla, but Camilla was deemed unsuitable. Camilla. She was also in love with, seriously in love with Andrew Parker Bowles. I mean, this woman chased him for seven years until she cornered him into marrying her. Well, and Amanda, um, Parker Bowles was also uh, dating Princess Anne during this period. So Camilla was off the table. She was, well, they say unsuitable, which was their rather polite way of saying not a virgin. You know, it's just, sorry, those were the times. The fact that Camilla had been around, had dated, um, no, they, they were having no part of her. That was a huge mistake on the part of the royal family, as we see now, but hindsight is twenty twenty. Camilla was the woman who could have made Charles happy because she's making him happy now. But he had been dating Camilla. She had married Andrew Parker Bowles, so she was at least temporarily out of the picture, as we later saw. So he was looking for a wife. Charles had to get married. Charles absolutely believed it was imperative that he marry and produce legitimate heirs. And that, by the way, is going to be a theme in this. So 
Diana was there. She was available. I, I, I don't think Charles loved her. Now that's, I can't say one way or another. I think he was simply ticking off boxes. You know, she's young, she's pretty, she's from the right family. Her grandmothers, both of them had been well connected with the royal family. Yes, you know, and of course the royal family approved of her. So do you think that he lied to Princess to Lady Diana though? Because she clearly believed she really thought that he loved her because she actually, in, in her own words, said that you know she really thought he loved her because he said so. <laughs> well, <laughs> The, the problem with that is we all remember the engagement interview when they asked, you know, are you in love? And Diana said, of course. And Charles said, whatever in love means. I would have jumped his ass right there. So. Oh, it looked like she was going to. It's like you could just watch the color rain from her face. That, that must have been a horrifying moment for her. And it happened on camera. So there was no taking that one back. But was he in love with her? No, he was undoubtedly still in love with Camilla. And we see that later. You know, at this moment, Camilla was out of his life, but she had been the great love of his life and was, again, like always. So was he in love with Diana? I think we have to ask ourselves if a 30-year-old man with Charles's education and experience and his worldliness at that time could genuinely be in love with a 19-year-old girl who was not very mature, even for a 19-year-old girl of that time. Is that, do we find that credible? Because I would have to say no. He probably had affection for her. He probably liked her very much. He was probably quite committed to making the marriage work. But what his idea of a marriage was, was not hers. And all we have to do is look at what Diana looked like on her wedding day. And we see immediately what her idea of a marriage was. And it was a Cinderella story. It was happily ever after. It was here I am in this big dress that that like billows out for four blocks. And, you know, I've got the tiara and the veil and everything's wonderful. Diana, whatever it was, she felt for Charles was undoubtedly mostly in her head, mostly the fantasies a 19-year-old girl has. Today, we would say the fantasies a 14-year-old girl has, because as you say, what, when they are like 14, they are just running rings around us. It was really different then. Yeah, the only thing I see different, though, is that whatever it was at the moment, she genuinely felt that she genuinely believed she loved him, and Absolutely. she genuinely believed his word like she said, that he would take care of her and love her. Absolutely. But if, okay, at our age, we look at that and we think, yeah, yeah right. You know, but she wasn't our age. She was barely, and, and like barely by inches out of her teens when they married. She had had no previous boyfriends. She had no experience with the world. I think she was in love with love. I really do. Was she in love with Charles? Well, as much in love as she could be, given her age, which was young. And her lack of experience? Yeah. It's just we've all been there we've all been teenagers and that first love looks awfully real but we look back on it and say good lord what was i thinking and it's it's normal it's it's not diana's fault i think that's kind of the point i really want to stress she was doing the best she could under circumstances that were just not propitious from the get-go he was, 
he was not the man for her. She was not the woman for him. Also, I find that Charles is very selfish and entitled. And he can be petty and he can be uh, irritable. And she didn't have the experience to deal with that. Camilla, on the other hand, did and does. Uh, Camilla, well, Camilla had a different background. Camilla, Camilla claims that her childhood was like a, a, a children's book, out in the country, romping among the trees and the meadows. And, you know, um, so, yes, Camilla came to this from a very, very different perspective. Diana, and, and of course, this is part of Diana's story. Diana came from a broken home that was incredibly acrimonious. Her parents fought like cats and dogs. Her father sued her mother for custody of the children. Her father got his mother-in-law, uh, with Diana's mother's mother, to support him when he asked for custody. It The divorce shattered the family, and yeah. it shattered all the relationships within it. And I think what Diana took from this was a profound insecurity, a profound need to be loved, and a rather remarkable ability to manipulate people. This is very common in the children of divorce. And I think that her early childhood and having that foundation pulled out from under her, she was seven when they divorced, having that foundation pulled out from under her so early in life led to a lot of the issues like the paranoia that surfaced toward the end of her life and undoubtedly contributed to her death. It, I'm not going to say it was the cause of her death, but her paranoia was certainly a contributing factor. If she I think they got aggravated, though, Sue, after what, uh, what's his name? Um... <sighs> Uh, this guy, the, the interview from BBC did to her because oh, she, was, she, she was actually getting better. And and I, um, and he, he wouldn't have been able to get near her had it not been because he was very clever. He went to her brother and, and he convinced the brother and the brother immediately ran to that. That's why the Princess Diana Martin Bashir yes. believed it. And that, that, you know, it, I was reading in the BBC thing he, because he told Earl Spencer that even the watches that William wore had microphones and everything. And I mean, and, and Earl Spencer believed it because this guy showed him documents with, they were paying for all these things. And can you imagine, this is why he dis, she dispensed of her bodyguards, you know, the so it, it is, didn't help. It didn't help. The fact is there's a special place in hell for Martin Bashir. Exactly. Uh, no question about it. This guy is probably the very definition of sleazy journalist. Third and class, yet yeah. he certainly preyed on Diana's fears. But of course, the fears were grounded in yeah. that horrible uh, broken home that she faced when she was a child. Yeah. This was not an easy thing for her to go through. And then as an adult, knowing what had taken place. And remember, her parents fought with each other, legal battles. She had been seeing her mother. Visitation had been allowed, and suddenly it wasn't. She saw what people could do. Now, at this That was point, one of her biggest fears, Sue, you know, when she was divorcing Charles, that she wouldn't be children. allowed to see her children, you know. And this is one of the things that I say to people, Sue. We have to see where people are coming from. Yeah. If you see that, you know, because they say, oh, she had bulimia and stuff. Actually, if, if we look at the pictures we saw of Lady Diana, she was actually a, a healthy looking teen. It wasn't until she started being with the royal family and, there, you know, and the things, like, the enormity of things hit her. Because I used to be anorexic, you know, and, 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 um, and, and you can see, I mean, I looked at pictures for pictures of her, you know, like looking ill, but she was actually quite normal, you know, for weight and everything. I, I mean, it's incredible. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And certainly when she was a young girl, the insecurities and the fractured home set her up for 
the later uh, troubles that she faced. So she was always going to look at things through a very specific lens. Yes, yes. Of course, she was going to think her children would be taken from her because her father, the Earl, took the children away from her mother. She saw it happen. This wasn't a mindless threat to her. It was her own personal Real. history. So sure, if her father could take her from her mother, why couldn't Charles take her boys from her? And I think we get, well, I'm probably getting a little ahead of myself, but this is a good place to throw in Tiggy Leg Burke, the nanny. And Diana was very paranoid about Tiggy. Uh, Tiggy became the children's nannies when um, Harry would have been about nine and William would have been about 11. And she stayed in Charles's employ as nanny and then in his personal household staff somewhere. But Tiggy, Tiggy was very unlike Diana. Diana was more a city girl and Tiggy was very much, you know, old school out in the country. Let us get a gun and a horse and and she actually said that. I think she said, I give the boys rifles and horses, and Diana gives them tennis rackets and popcorn at the movie theaters. So there was a competitiveness there. And certainly, Diana, I think Diana did have reason to be concerned that Tiggy was alienating the affections of her sons. They were very, very close to Tiggy. However, Diana played her own part in that because as her marriage, well, I say as her marriage disintegrated, keep in mind that before Harry was even one year old, and this is words from Diana's own mouth, she had already transferred her affections over to Barry Manneke. So Harry was an infant when she was deeply and passionately in love with him. Yes, and that is Barry with William. And look how young William is in that picture. So that tells you where we are in the chronology of their marriage. Here's Barry. There's William, um, who is, what, two, three years old there. And this is the, the new love of Diana's life. So she had already begun pulling out of the marriage. We don't know what happened in that relationship. We do know, uh, because Manneke was not around and Diana never was never specific about how far things got between the two of them. However, they did plan to run away together and Manneke was pulled out of that protection detail for an inappropriate relationship with Diana, which meant it was known. Whatever was going on- Isn't that knew. insane though, Sue? Because um, it shows how chauvinistic uh, Charles was because he was screwing Camilla, you know? Well, and, and it was like we don't know when that began. Actually, but, you know what? Yes. Let me let me tell you something. It is I don't know if you heard of a guy named Stuart Higgins. Possibly yes. Um, Stuart Higgins familiar. was the editor of the Sun back then, way back then. When Princess Diana died, I'm gonna send you that link. When okay. Princess Diana died, um, about a year later, you know the whole. Everybody was trying to find somebody to blame because nobody wanted to understand that she died in a car accident, you know, yeah. from a drunk driver. Everybody wanted to blame somebody. So he wrote so many articles about Princess Diana. Um, one of them, in, to the point that in 1981, the queen summoned, uh, asked her private secretary to summon the heads of the newspapers to the palace to say to leave Princess Diana because she was pregnant with William at the mm -hmm. time. And then uh, Stuart Higgins apologized, issued a written apology saying that he was really sorry for all the grief 
he had called Prince, First Lady Diana and then Princess Diana because he broke the story of the royal, the blonde and the royal train. And it turns out that it was Camilla because only Charles and Camilla know about it because he phoned her an hour before she arrived from the royal train. And yet he managed to find out that Camilla was, there's that grainy picture. So he apologized for that. He apologized because one of the things that Diana thought she was losing her mind, that's gaslighting 101, uh, that how did they find out that she left Balmoral early? How did they find out that she was having, you know, like the eating disorders and stuff like that? And she would ask Charles and Charles would say, oh, you're crazy. That's not happening. And it turns out, according to Stuart Higgins' own words, that Camilla was his source and that she he she was basically doing what Megan is doing now. But of course, without Internet, you know, she would phone him once or twice, you know, uh, a, a week. And when she felt that it was really urgent and she had like news that she needed out in the in the news, she would phone him three or four times. So she would even see him in person. And he apologized for that because, you know, he said that he never thought that, you know, that he would play a part in that and that he was really sorry. But, you know, I always find that people always apologize when they can't do anything about it. You know, he should have stopped, my opinion. Well, uh, see, I don't find anything coming out of the press at that time to be particularly credible. Because remember, this whole Diana being smuggled into the train story, Buckingham Palace went to the media and said, no, and stop writing this. And they refused. They yeah, it was Camilla, though. It was Camilla who notified Stuart Higgins that she was the one going. And that happened three months prior to the engagement announcement, which is why Prince, w Prince Philip had a chat with Charles and he said, and actually Charles wrote it in his in his memoir book, you know, the, the one in 1994 by Dimbleby, I think is his name, where he says that my father had a chat with me that, you know, after the scandal broke because Diana said that wasn't me, she knew it wasn't her, you know, and that's when she started having her suspicions about Camilla, right? My and then, uh, yeah, and then Prince Philip said, listen, you either, if you're not serious about Lady Diana, break it up because her reputation is starting to suffer. Her her honor, because, you know, Prince Philip thought of, in, those terms, right. in those terms, you know, her, her honor and maybe also because she was so young, you know, and he's and, and, and when Charles says, and I took that as an ultimatum. Well, my concern about the press's participation in this is if they knew it was Camilla. Why would they not issue the apology Buckingham Palace demanded? Because they said, you need to apologize for saying this was Diana. If they knew it was Camilla, why would they not have apologized? No, they trenched in and insisted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was disgusting. And this is, this is one of the things, Sue, so that this is one of the problems we have, that the palace was protecting Charles. And they, apparently they all knew about Charles and Camilla. Apparently it was an open secret, you know? And everybody ever since then, they've been just like they're protecting now Megan with the bullying report, you know, like they're never going to release it because of those kind of things. And it's like, it's disgusting, but no, sorry about that. I just, I just wanted to point that. I apologize. No, like, no, no, I, I, I was absolutely aware of that particular story, but as I say, if it's coming from the press during that period, my trust levels are very low Yeah, because they were behaving abysmally. Uh, they were claiming it was Diana. They trenched in yeah. and refused to back down. And, yeah, and if Diana they, was really upset. They knew it wasn't. Then they were lying. Stuart yeah. Higgins apologized for that story so much. He said that he wishes he he hadn't written that story. But this is we're talking 1998 after Diana died. You after know Diana they should have done that right then and there. Well, and the fact is too that a lot of people after Diana died were backing away from their previously held positions because there were a lot of people who thought Diana was dreadful for the royal family. They thought, especially after the divorce, um, before the divorce too, but especially after the divorce, that Diana was a loose cannon and that they needed to somehow rein her in because she was 
creating scandal. So a lot of people had to kind of backpedal on that. When she was dead, no one wanted to be the man or woman who had badmouthed, you know, St. Diana, who was... It's like right now with Catherine, you know, everybody, how they were trashing her and everything. And then she came out and said she has cancer. And I mean, it's disgusting. Well, you know, it's difficult, but uh, I, I don't know. And here's the thing, not a fly on the wall. I don't know the extent to which Charles and Camilla had reunited during this period. It seems very likely that by 86, and I'm just going to throw that out there as a date, it seems likely that by 86, they were seeing each other again. Uh, Because certainly by 86, Diana was playing the field herself. At that point, the marriage had irretrievably broken down because Diana was in love with someone else. She was sufficiently open about the relationship with Manneke that they felt it necessary to pull him out. Now then, in 87, Manneke died in a car accident. And of course, Diana's paranoia went into overdrive. Um, She said that she believed that Buckingham Palace or the British government, or James Bond, I don't know who she was blaming it on, had had him killed. Now, of course, that's, well, if that's true, then all I can say is James Bond is not half the man I always thought he was, because the accident in which Manneke died, it was a two-car accident, the motor scooter he was on was being driven by an off-duty police officer. Manneke was also a police officer. And the car they struck was being driven by a 17-year-old girl with a license she had only had for a few weeks. So we know the cause of the accident. No offense to this girl, 10 o'clock at night, a teenage girl, new driver's license, She made a turn that she shouldn't have made, and that was what happened. If British intelligence is using 17-year-old girls as their hired assassins, doesn't speak very well for the government, does it? So I think that fact alone should be enough to indicate that there was this was nothing more than an accident. There was certainly not a hired killer going yeah. after Manneke. But Diana's paranoia went into overdrive at that point. She believed he was killed, but murdered, that this was an assassination. So, um, oh, I like that picture. Me too. Let's move Isn't back. how beautiful she was, huh? She was a very pretty girl. Very pretty. Why do they compare her to Meghan Markle? Can you explain that to me, Sue, please? Like I'm an idiot because I I don't understand why they keep saying she's just like she's Diana 2.0. Well, the only person saying that is not Meg herself. Oh, and And Harry. Yeah, well, yeah, but, you know, that's like getting a trained monkey to say what you tell them to say. The fact is there's no comparison. Diana was very real, very genuine. What I love about this picture is this is during their engagement. And this is when you see Diana as a 19-year-old girl wading into waters she has never been in before. Notice her posture, the way she's kind of hunched over and holding her arms to her chest. This is a girl who is not aware of how pretty she is, for one thing. She is not aware that she is the star of the show and not comfortable with the attention. Uh, And what we see here is the real Diana being poured into that 
Princess of Wales mold that she would later grow into. But, you know, here we have it. This is Diana. Um, and what we see here is an attractive woman with brown hair. Remember, her hair was brown at the time. She had been blonde as a small child. But at this point, her hair was brown. And she is in a low-cut dress. And all of the other pictures we have of Diana from this period were collars up to here. She was, she was a product of her times in that in the early uh, 1980s. The look, the style that was popular was very Victorian. It was high collars. The 80s was big shoulders and heavy sweaters. I remember. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. You would. Most young people don't, however. They, they don't remember that that was an anomaly for this period. And it's clearly a look Diana was not comfortable with, even though, as I say, she eventually grew into it. But this is Diana on her own, just a pretty young woman, unfortunately being thrown out there with very little preparation and without the self-confidence she needed to fill that role. This, this is before the marriage. And again, like I say, 19 years old, no real experience, no education to speak of. And not and she didn't know how beautiful she was. She didn't oh, she, even, wasn't even aware of her own sexuality, how beautiful and attractive she was. No, not at all. And Diana, Diana was not one of these women who used her good looks to her advantage. Unlike Nutmeg, who, of course, just she just throws. Uh, well, yeah, okay, great. Yes, <laughs> I, I just thought I couldn't help myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> she just throws it out there at you. She she uses her sexuality as a lure, as a weapon, as uh, this is what she's selling. Period. Diana, not at all. Diana didn't even realize the extent to which she had these marketable goods, not even close. So that's one of the major, major differences. Um, but before we get too far afield, I did want to go back and talk about how it is that Diana's early life impacted her children because she treated William and Harry very, very differently. Oh, now that's Diana in the wading boots and the ugly Christmas sweater. And, you know, this was, this was who Charles thought she was, by the way. This was who she was raised to be. It was not who she actually was. Because this is before Diana found her own voice, which she probably didn't really find until she was in her mid-20s which is unusual. This is a woman who would have been married for five years and have two children before she even knew who she was. So when I talk about Diana not knowing her own mind, it's important to remember that that wasn't her fault. She was simply too young and sheltered, too inexperienced to know her own mind. And too traumatized too, you know. And it's, isn't it insane that all she wanted to do was to have a home, be a wife, have a happy child, you know, have a stable home because that was her major thing. She wanted to have what she never had as a child, which was right. a happy home. Diana probably did not have the skills to have that happy home. Again, well, if he had had a different home. husband, if Charles had been supportive, patient, and actually really loved her, that it would have worked, you know, but of course it I wasn't. Well, work. I have to disagree on that because I think Diana was too badly damaged. Wow. I, I really do. I think the damage was too deep. It was too early. It was too all encompassing for her to find happiness in marriage. She had no template. She didn't know what a happy marriage looked like. She she would have had 
whatever romantic fantasies every teenage girl has. And then romantic fantasies are fine, but then you wake up in the morning and the breakfast dishes are on the on the sink and you know it's the fantasy comes crashing in. The first sign of trouble, the first crack, the first disagreement, and your fantasy explodes and you don't have anything left. I don't think Diana had the necessary skills. Now, if she had uh, a relationship with a man that was more measured, that was not rush, rush, because remember, she and Charles couldn't have had more than a, a scant handful of dates before they became engaged. And those dates are not what we would call dates. They would have been very public. They would not have been alone together. They would not have, a, have had a chance to talk, to get to know one another because of the situation. Obviously, Diana's reputation needed to be protected. Charles couldn't be seen off with a teenage girl. You know, they're... Their position really made, made it impossible for the two of them to spend. This is the kind of time they would have spent together in the back of a car on their way to a very formal engagement. That's how they would have gotten to know each other. How much can you know about a person? Look how in, she looks in that car. She looks like she's, she wants to disappear, doesn't it? Yes. She looks terrified. And I think that's what we need to keep in mind. She knew she was in over her head. And she didn't have the support to help bring her to that position she needed to be in. So I look at that and say, could she have really had a happy marriage? Well, maybe with the right man if she had plenty of support. If all of the circumstances were right, you'd need a perfect storm for this because she was very, very damaged. And that level of damage just, it creeps out. It's just, it's hard. To so this is why it. I said, had she had a different husband, somebody who gave was incredibly supportive and who, who would take the time to, to help her and guide her. Because that's what she No needed. ordinary man. That is absolutely no ordinary man. Yeah. That would have to be someone very, very special, you know, a one in a million. And even then, I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, it is alleged that she had postpartum depression after William was born. Uh, we know, because she said so, that she threw herself down a flight of stairs when she was pregnant with William. This is a woman who had some very, very serious issues that undoubtedly came from that highly damaged life that she had as a child. And it didn't help that she got into that kind of marriage and situation with a man who was, you know, didn't. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, I understand that Queen was busy and stuff like that. So it would have fallen to Charles. But I always felt that Charles is too selfish. It was all about him, 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 him. Yes. And Charles had been raised to be selfish. He yeah. was going to be king one day. So, you know, it's just everything I hate about a monarchy, you know, the very idea that some people are considered innately superior to others. Well, Charles buys into that hook, line, and sinker. So was he right for her? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, and remember, when she married Charles, she was in the same position her mother had been in. Yeah. Her mother was married to a man, and at the time, he was the heir to the earldom. He wasn't an earl yet. But her mother was married to a man who needed a male heir. And her brother has said that he believes that pressure is what forced his parents' marriage down the toilet because they had uh, three daughters, B 
before uh, the the brother, uh, Charles, Diana called him Carlos. So I'm going to call him Carlos to differentiate between King Charles. They had three daughters before Carlos came along and a previous son who had died very shortly after birth. So by the time they finally got that male heir, a lot of damage had been done. Diana was in the same high pressure situation her mother was in. Now she produced an heir very, very quickly, but it had to have played into her thinking. The pressure to get pregnant, produce a boy, you know, and then of course get pregnant, produce the girl that Charles wanted, and then come up short because another boy. Um, and by the way, I don't think that was something that was overtly communicated to Harry when he was a child, no matter what he says. I don't think that that is something either one of his parents laid on him. Um, what happened with the boys is as the marriage disintegrated, Diana went to William as the older of her sons, and obviously the more intellectually gifted of the two, and used him as a confidant. She would talk to William about her troubles, and when she didn't feel things were going well, it was William she would turn to. Um, Harry, on the other hand, was more her emotional support, and she did a lot of damage to Harry in that regard. Diana, as I mentioned, was not academic. She had no interest in education. It was not something she valued. So if she was feeling lonely or blue, she would just keep Harry home from school to keep her company. And they would cuddle on the sofa and watch movies or whatever it was they did. But she taught Harry from a very early age that education was not important. It was something that could be dispensed with if you wanted to spend time watching movies. So I don't think she did Harry any great service in that. But you know, I also wonder, Sue, sorry, I also yeah. wonder if this also comes, because let, don't forget that this is a very rarefied environment when where they don't have a need to earn a living because it's, right. it's you know, like the where they're going. I mean, look at the queen. The queen didn't have any, like, if you look at all the royals, I think that, that Charles was the first one to go to university or something like that. I mean, it, it's not something that's encouraged because... Pretty much the, her their their roles are are planned for them, and they don't really have any economic drive for it. I mean, do, do you think that would be? And also, she's very much a product of her own of her own time in that sense. Oh well, it's you know it's the aristocracy in general. Uh, Princess Anne, who absolutely could have benefited from a yeah. university education. This is an intelligent, driven woman. I love her. Uh, oh, so do I. I think Anne is just she's so kick ass. I swear to God, so the woman who should have been king. Yeah. <laughs> Anne had no college, none. And they said that it was Anne's choice, but I think it was a choice that was made for her by the, the environment she came Grew into. Up. Yeah. So what you have is a social class that didn't view education as important, which is why they've all been a passel of idiots for the last 400 years. Um, maybe 400, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna stick with 400. Uh, this is why none of them have been considered over bright, not since the Tudors. I don't know what happened in the royal family, but it's important to remember that in the 16th century, they educated the bejesus out of them, not just Edward, but Mary and Elizabeth. Yeah, I don't know why that happened. They were educated. They say Elizabeth spoke seven languages, and we know from her translations of Latin and Greek works that she spoke at least four 
to a level at which she could write translations of these yeah. works. Uh, I, something went wrong. At some point, they became anti-intellectual, but the entire British aristocracy is anti-intellectual. It's almost as if getting an education is something for, you know, the, the, the lower class. Exactly. Well, I don't need it because I don't have to work. Whatever happened to education as a means of broadening your mind, broadening your perspective. Absolutely. So Absolutely. Diana was very typical of her class. And remember Camilla, Camilla was sent to finishing school too, like Diana. Camilla has no education other than high school and a finishing school. And no education beyond high school. This was pretty normal for them. Um, and certainly, it's very, very easy to see that when young people, now Charles does have a university education. It's very easy to see that Diana might have looked at Harry and said, oh, well, He's never going to go anywhere and do anything. He's just going to go off and, you know, be Duke of whatever and live in the country. Sure. I understand. But remember, Diana herself was not overly bright. I yeah. do not blame her because of her close-minded attitude toward education. Very few people in 1980 in that social strata could have anticipated the need for the level of education the rest of us need just to get from one day to the next with technology dominating everything we do with the internet making a much smaller world for us. Um, but yeah, this is what we have. This is very much the embodiment of what Diana would have thought life was going to be like for her boys when they grew up, that at some point they would be sitting in the country house at the piano with their own poorly educated children tinkling on the piano keys. <laughs> they couldn't have, well, they couldn't have seen what was coming. Yeah. But I think that was one of the one of the reasons that William and Harry turned out to be very different. Oh, really? Diana, Diana drew on William's strength and support, but with Harry, she drew on his ability to comfort her emotionally. May I ask you something that you're touched on that since you're saying that I guess that Diana was able to pick that that William was, had that quality and that Harry had this other quality because apparently she did she was not smart but she was she had emotional intelligence in that regards so do you think that she picked that for on the fact that maybe William was a stronger one and Harry was thick as she was oh she often said that Harry was like her thick as a plank well She didn't put those two together. She described herself as thick as a plank, and she said Harry was like her. So there you go. There's the equation. She saw more of herself in Harry. I also think that from day one, she knew William was never going to be hers and hers alone. He was the heir to the throne. He would always be shared with the royal family, with Charles with the Queen, with Philip, with the British public in general. And I think that the, the bonding she had with Harry was based on the fact that she felt Harry was the one she could keep, the one she could have to herself. Probably explains why she was quick to take him out of school, why she indulged him, why, even though it's very clear that he was not a well-behaved child, she let him get away with so much. 
William was going to have to grow up and fill a role in the royal family. And I think Diana thought she could just grab Harry by his shirt collar and pull him aside and keep him for herself. Doesn't mean I think she loved Harry more than William. I, uh, What mother does love one child more than another? I just think that she viewed them in very different contexts. William had a destiny that was going to take him away from her. I think she was hoping that Harry would have a destiny that would keep him with her. So you know, I'm going to do the speculation. I wanted to ask you something. Where was Charles in all of this? Because I know, I'm not saying you are, but everybody blames Diana like as though Diana was a single mother. Because I'm not saying you are, but a lot of people will ask this question. No. Where was Charles? Because, you know, especially given the fact that they were married, uh, why you would think that Charles who complained in, in that book in 1994 that he had a horrendous childhood because he was alone all the time, his parents were never there, that he would make more of an effort to be present in the life of his children so as not to repeat that pattern, you know? I would say, first of all, Charles had a lot of responsibilities as Prince of Wales. We know that. And that's one factor that took him out of the picture. The marriage had broken down. By the time the children were this age, look at them. We know Diana was in love with Barry Manneke. We know this from her own words. She was in love with another man by this point. So Diana was already absenting herself from the marriage. They were probably well on their way to living separate lives at this point. So was Charles not there because he was choosing not to be there? Or was he not there because their lives were becoming separate? They were pulling apart. And I would say that is the most likely situation, that Diana had her time with the kids and Charles had his time with the kids, even at such an early stage. Because, well, we know. You that. think that they both share the kids, right? I think they both shared the children, but I don't think they did it when they were in the same room. No, I understand. But you would think that the kids spent equal time with them, right? Like in separate places, maybe? or I, I think that did, in fact, happen. Um, then, then how come everybody blames Diana only or say, oh, she's to blame and nobody says she's to blame for William or she's not praised for how William turned out? You know why everybody blames her for Harry's misbehavior? I'm just asking because a lot of people ask me that. Well, I think that Diana is probably the one who was responsible for the fact that William and Catherine have this 10 year long, you know, sometimes interrupted courtship. I think that was Diana's influence when she would go to him about her marital troubles. I think he knew before he met Catherine that marriage was not always picture perfect. And that probably does a lot to explain that, that inordinately long courtship period that he wanted to be very sure so i don't know how Catherine might feel about that by well, the way I, think happy, you know, they, they, I mean in a way i understand it because if you for example um for in my I, i'm sorry i'm going to relate it a little bit to my personal situation yeah. but i was in a very abusive relationship with my son and i remember i thought i was staying in that relationship because for my son's sake and then when i finally got divorced my son broke down and say, why didn't you do it earlier? And it actually colors the way he sees things in spite of the fact that I try to keep as much as possible out. But, you know, he grew up and he has reservations to things, you know, no matter what we do, you know how children are so intuitive. And, and I wonder if that, you know, William seen all the pain that his mother, because she also told him that, you know, she barely knew her, her, her uh, Charles when they got married. So I wonder if that, played a role and and also i would be too because william could see how much his mother was hurt i mean what do you think i'm sure it did 
Charles, on the other hand, now keep in mind, Diana was very open with her sons about her unhappiness in the marriage. Charles was not. That's not in his nature. So the, the boys very likely saw Diana as a victim of Charles's bad behavior because she probably painted herself that way to them and because seeing Charles in pain was not something they, they could relate to because Charles has that reserve. And he was raised in the royal family. He grew up with cameras flashing in his face. He knew from his earliest childhood that he would he would one day be king. He needed to keep that stiff upper lip and he needed not to get involved in public demonstrations of emotion. It's Charles, it's his nature. It's the way he was raised. And remember, he was a lot older than Diana. So he is from another generation. She was born in the 1960s. He was born in the 1940s. Now, they were each baby boomers, different ends of that generation. But I think the fact that he was, at least initially, a product of the 40s, she was a product of the 60s, was very coloring in terms of who they turned out to be as adults. So did William and Harry see Charles's pain as the marriage collapsed? No. No, that's really not very likely. Did they see their father? Absolutely. And we have plenty of photographic evidence of this. We also know even that, Princess Diana said he was a great father at the beginning, that he would rush to the home, to the house, back to the castle <laughs> to bathe the children, you know, and to to feed them and everything at the beginning, at least. I don't know if, how that changed later on, but in her own words, she said yeah. he was a very good father at the beginning. But what we have during this period, the period in this picture, which is mid 80s going through to the 90s when they finally officially separated was a marriage in disintegration. And when the marriage disintegrated completely, Charles went out and got a good nanny for the kids. And so um, William was 11 and Harry was nine when they got Tiggy. And they just very quickly transferred their affections to her. So when they got a stable mother figure um, who was not expecting them to either be their security blanket or their confidant, which is what Diana's expectations were. When they got a stable mother figure, they, they had no trouble bonding with Tiggy, none. So despite the fact that I think that Diana's impact on these boys was significant and profound and probably explains a lot about the adults they've become. Charles had an impact too. It's very likely that Charles's impact was a lot stronger on William, in part because Charles from his generation would have consciously or unconsciously prioritized the heir to the throne. No two ways around that. That would have been, it would have been what many, many, many generations of British monarchs before him. Would yeah, have you know, you know, sorry to interrupt. I remember that, that I, Harry complained that the Queen Mother would invite William and not him for tea because they were trying to help him <laughs> to the role, you know, the William to the role, because it's actually quite a heavy thing. I mean, this is a picture of lady, later years, Princess Diana with, uh, with, her, with her sons. And this is, we're moving into the point at which Diana considered herself to be in direct competition with Tiggy, the nanny. Yeah. Uh, and she was, 
you know, she was. There's no question about it. When you look at what was going on between the two women, Tiggy encouraged the boys to view her as a mother figure. Diana, that was wrong, though. I would have been pissed. Well, yes, anybody would have been. Diana was angry and fought back. The problem is in, in a situation of extreme marital discord, anything Diana did to fight back, especially if she was fighting back against the woman who was providing them with that maternal stability, was going to make her look like the bad guy. So, yeah, Diana was in a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Um, she could see that her children were slipping away from her. She wasn't happy about it. Who would be? Also, they were moving into the age where they were going to those places that the schools, that boarding schools, remember? Yep. Is that and right? This, exactly. And this is the age at which children tend to withdraw from their parents and rebel. All kids do that. Yeah, that is, Thank you, you can see, you can see how happy the boys are with Tiggy. It's just, this is their idea of bliss. So yeah, she gave them a stability that their own nuclear family wasn't providing. Uh, and they invited her to school events when they didn't want to have to choose which parent to invite. It's like, well, we're not inviting either one of you. Tiggy will come. And I don't think anybody liked that very much. But I, I can easily understand why that would have been their go-to position. They were children. And they were caught up in something that was bigger than themselves. Because Charles and Diana's divorce was not just Charles and Diana. It was the Prince and Princess of Wales. It was on the front pages. It was all over the place. So yeah, this was, this was a far more impactful divorce for William and Harry than it would have been if they were just William and Harry Smith the shopkeeper's children. So, yeah, very, very difficult. But I think this is, this is why they developed into such different people. William was infused with a sense of responsibility very young, and he rebelled against that. We all know that William had his period of rebelling against the responsibility they they were making jokes in the media about William being work shy when he first came of age and was not ready to shoulder the responsibility. But he was infused with that sense, whereas Harry was raised to believe that he could do what he wanted to do. It didn't really matter that he, like his mother, could do as he pleased and then smile and all would be forgiven. And frankly, the media played into that too. So I don't know what to say. I see this as something that we can easily trace back. The completely alienated brothers at this point, that process of alienation probably started when they were quite young and their roles in the family were differentiated by their mother uh, and by their father. So I'm not going to let Charles off the hook. William was the heir and William was getting more attention in that sense than Harry. Period. Also, I can sense a lot of envy from Harry because he also felt that his mother, because especially in his book, Spare, he said that was that famous, or even an interview he's given about William, that famous resemblance to my mother. I look at him and it's gone. He's got like, I mean, he really has a resentment and envy. And I, one of my, my subscribers, I, I told him that I was going to interview you and they sent me this question. Um, how do you think, given what we've discussed, the impact on what you think Princess Diana and Charles 
they both, because Charles was very aloof, he might have been present, but he was aloof. Right. You know, as you said, he hired himself a nanny instead of actually stepping up, stepping up, you know, to the role and say, okay, you know, like some other fathers do that they compensate with time and blah, blah, blah. Two things. Do you think that from what you've said, it's logical how William is behaving because he saw what happened in his uh, own home. He's very unhappy with that. He doesn't want that for himself. He wanted something different. So he, he, he played it safe. He wanted to be sure. We're never sure of anything in life, you know, but he tried to do the best he could to avoid the situation he grew up in. Whereas Harry grew up blaming people um, even even by standards, because I know Princess Diana used to chastise him. Like when she took him on a bus tour and and the driver was uh, Pakistani and Harry was horrible and she slapped him and made him get out and apologize, you know, um, and, and, you know, because he used to misbehave not only with Princess Diana, but also with Charles. Just nobody ever said anything, you know. But uh, do you think that, given what you explained, that William's path it's predictable but do you think that harry's path is predictable with what he's done wrong well let me just go quickly back to that bus mm -hmm. incident harry was extremely young when he threw racial slurs at a bus driver we have to ask ourselves how in the world would a very young child even know those words. Yes. He was picking that up at home. I have no idea who it was that was throwing this around. For all I know, it or school, or school. Remember that he spent most of his time in school. Yeah, well, he, he that may be possible, but ordinarily, children do not throw words like that around casually if it's not tolerated at home. So I don't think you, but do you think that Diana would have allowed that because she was not racist by any stretch of the imagination? We have absolutely no idea what Diana was like when the cameras were not flashing. We don't know. We know that Diana in public was very embracing of people with disabilities, people of, of different ethnicities. We know that, but we're not a fly on the wall. And one thing I do know about children and where they pick this stuff up. They generally don't get it in school. When they have attitudes like this, it is from home. But remember, it wasn't just Charles and Diana who were in that home. It would have been servants. It would have been bodyguards. These children would have had uh, an exposure to a great many adults most of whom we'll never be able to identify simply because they were children of the upper classes and were often cared for by a number of paid employees. So we don't know, but we do have to keep that in mind that even at a very early age, Harry had already decided that it was okay to throw racial slurs around. Because William is not known for that. No, um, I never heard anything of that, about William having done that. I've heard an awful lot about Harry having done that. Now, Harry's comeback would be, oh, yeah, William did the same thing, but the press covered it up because the palace covers it up and, you know, they throw me under the bus to protect him. Uh, I don't know. I, I absolutely do not know. And I've completely strayed from the question. You were talking what? about, no, you were talking about that you needed to go back to when they were small and Harry was being racist or where yes. he picked up those and words. I'm because not. we were wondering about the points whether we could see that basically would be predictable for William to, yes. to take that path. But Harry, would you predict this given now, especially after spare, that we can see how much he, how much hatred he has and envy? Because to me, that thing yes. should not be called spared. It should have been called envy. I find this utterly predictable because really? of what happened three generations before. 
with George. And, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I find it absolutely predictable. It's just a question of a different birth order with the brothers. George was the one who went out, did what he was supposed to do, married the right woman from the right background, had the children, and towed the line. Whereas Edward was the playboy prince who eventually married the wrong woman and hated and resented everyone to the point, well, we talked about this last time, where he told the Nazis to bomb the crap out of his own country. 40,000 people you told us that died, huh? Horrific. I don't understand why that man wasn't hung, hung you know, to tell you the truth. He no, should he have been executed. Been. He should have been. The British government covered it up and they got the American government to collude with them in covering it up. So what can I say? There's a lot of blame to go around for that one. But I find this absolutely predictable. The part that isn't predictable was the birth order. That's all. But we're looking at the same personality types. The the party boy, the I don't want to work. I want to just go play. And that was Edward. And now it's Harry. And he wants to just do whatever it is he wants to do and is bitterly resentful of his brother. Meanwhile, Edward, of course, was bitterly resentful of his brother once his brother took over as king. Both of them just said, I'm stepping back. Well, that's Harry's term. I'm stepping back. Edward said, I'm stepping down. They both said, I don't want this job. And the minute they walked away, then it's like, oh, I want to come back. We are seeing this playing out over and over again. Do I think it was predictable? More so than any other family dynamic I've really witnessed. Wow. So, and do you think that Harry, two things, do you think that because of the way he is, because do you think that's his nature to be that petty? Uh, because you, I, I, you know, I don't want to cry, but I remember one time here, uh, there's a lot of poverty where I live. Uh, and there were two kids. I was eating with my son at a restaurant, and there were two children and a mother outside sitting, obviously, in the street. They didn't have any food. So my son goes, Mom, give him food, right? So I bought them a huge plate, and I gave it to the mother, right? So No, sorry, to one of the little kids. So the little kid took it, and the other kid immediately tried to grab it all without sharing with anybody, whereas the other little one, gave it you know for them both and the other one when the little kid the other one that had given him the plate for them to share tried to reach out to get the food the other kid got snapped you, you know what i mean so do you think it's nature or that is his nature to be that petty because this is something that you don't teach anybody this is something that you are in life you know like uh yeah i think so but i mean i could be wrong i could be full of shit, but i no, i agree with that that it probably is his nature because usually times of stress bring out our, our true nature. When times are good, when everything's rolling along smoothly, we all, we all have the luxury to be our best selves. And when things are bad, that's when our worst selves start to creep out. When there's stress in our in our circumstances, that's when the the ugly underbelly starts to show. So, do I think the real Harry was the happy-go-lucky kid, or the Harry we see now, jealous of every? jealous of every preference that was ever shown to his brother, even right down to the fact that his brother is older and destined to be monarch. Yes, I think that is Harry. I think the good time Charlie he was, that that hail fellow well met, that was something he could afford to do in the good old days when everything was 
moving along when life was handed to him on a silver platter. He never had to do anything for it. Yeah. Because that, again, human nature, the bad times show us who we really are. And, and one thing also, um, do you think that there was any other woman that, that Harry would have picked to marry if he had, do you think that Harry would have been happy with a decent woman? Or do you think that Megan, the reason why he chose Megan, because this is a choice. It's because they're both, they both fulfill something in each other. Because a lot of well, people want to say, oh, Megan exploited him. I mean, what, where do you stand with that? I don't think he chose her. I think she targeted him and <laughs> just enveloped him in a spider's web. So I really want to be very clear about that. I do not think he chose her. I think he may well have wanted to bed her when he met her. Woo! <laughs> he, he, he was going to be his life partner. No, I think she played that. And this was her. I think if Harry had come across the right woman, You know, some good-natured young English girl off in the countryside, maybe he could have had a happier life. The problem is the women who were involved with Harry before Nutmeg did her magic on him do not speak well of him. That's what I was going to tell you, that it is, this is why, this is why where I wanted to get to you, because decent women like Chelsea, a very smart lady. She was with him for eight years. He cheated on her. That's known. He was not very nice to her. And, and the same thing with Cressida. Cressida even posted a, a tweet back then when it was Twitter that he was actually pretty nasty and paranoid, you know, and that, that, that he was angry all the time. And she said she valued her friendship with William and the family too much, you know. So this is why I asked you that question, because clearly... He didn't want a decent woman because no, no decent woman would put up with no, that. Well, because he had some opportunities, but he couldn't rise to the challenge. That's he, it's like you don't get a decent woman if you're not a decent man. There you, know, you go. At the best, what you're going to get is a doormat who puts up with your abuse. And I don't think anybody's happy with that long term. They might be short term. I think what he got from Megan was a woman who, well, is an actress. And it was a role for her. She played a part until she got what she wanted. Uh, and she tolerated things that normal, self-respecting women would not tolerate because normal, self-respecting women are not going to sacrifice their very soul in order to get a title. Megan, yeah, I. Uh, so, do you think that we're, we're to round up? Where do you think that? Do you think that, like Edward and, like the Duke of Windsor, do you think that he will die with this woman, or do you think that there will be a divorce? Because the difference I find, and I, I know people underestimate this, so, but internet is is it could be a powerful tool, or a powerful. <laughs> I mean, I sort of got you know like. I mean, nowadays you just click a button, enter, and it's everywhere. I think, for one thing, I think Wallace was a lot smarter than yeah. Megan. And she had class. She was classier. She had class. Well, my great aunt said so. My grandmother thought she was I vulgar. know you told me that. So, yeah, it's like I heard both stories, but I never heard anyone call her an idiot. So she was a lot smarter. Yeah. She, once she once she found herself in that relationship, she was not going to walk away from it. Megan, she thinks, now she has a personality disorder that Wallace did not have. She thinks she is the center of the known universe. She thinks Harry is the one who grabbed the brass ring when he got her. The woman, I saw that in opera. I had to walk away from my career. My, um. She absolutely 
believes she's the catch of the county. So will she walk away from him? I think if it suits her, she will. Absolutely. So do I think they will stay together forever? I think she's not Wallace Simpson. I think despite the fact that Edward and Harry have a lot in common, their wives, no, it's just a superficial similarity. Oh, okay, I, 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 I get it. Wallace was not as narcissistic as Meghan Markle. Oh, is. no, she no. Attention at 24-7. Exactly. And what will it take to make Meghan think Harry is no longer worth it? Well, if she had the life Wallace had with Edward, she would have skipped out before the end of the Second World War. Right. You know, that just, she would not have been content for that second class life. So do you think, though, just to wrap it up, do yeah. you think that she's happy with this outcome or because I don't think I really do believe that this is just my opinion that she really thought I'm going to screw everybody in England and I'm going to walk through those ultra A-list doors that were shut firmly in my face and I'm going to work with all these A-list directors because that was one of her prerequisites that she would only work with A-list directors. She thought that everybody was going to be kissing her butt, you know, and that she was going to be doing like, uh, I don't know, Julia Roberts or something like that. But now she finds herself being a failed influencer before she even takes off. Do you think she's happy with that outcome? No. I don't think there's any way she could be. I think Harry was a stepping stone, mm -hmm. that marrying a title was her way of breaking into Hollywood. As you say, she could just go in and then she would have the red carpet. Well, it didn't work out that way. I think she will be happy for a time with this new influencer website she has because <laughs> she loves spreading her truth far and wide. She was very happy when she was writing the TIG and it's like, look at me. I could, oh God. And her writing is just. <laughs> we have to do a video about the TIG. So you have to come oh, back. Man. I mean, we have to come back and do it. Like, you know what we should do? You should come and do a video about Catherine and Megan. That would be an interesting video. There, gosh, the only thing they have in common is their married names. That's all. They are both. Well, yeah, but the upbringing there were both very privileged growing up. If you think about it, I know that Catherine was from a middle class family, like yes. Meghan Markle. They both got top of top notch university. I mean, education across the board. And unlike Meghan Markle's version of upbringing, she actually did have a happy family upbringing, like Catherine. Well, it wasn't. I wouldn't say that her. Oh no! What I mean is, like, even even if we go by what his her cousin says, Sean Johnson, that they used to have family dinners, and I mean, it wasn't yeah, an acrimonious it thing. Was, I mean, it she, was not. No, it wasn't. But it also was not uh, a nuclear family in the way Catherine had. Oh no! I understand that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. But in terms of. In terms of the superficial, yes, absolutely. They both came from middle-class backgrounds. There was a degree of financial privilege, more so on Catherine's side. They were well-educated, but that's pretty much where it stops. Other than that, you're talking about people whose personalities were night and day. Catherine was not someone who wanted to be the center of attention. Catherine was not someone who expected people to cater to her every whim. She's beautiful. Uh, it, it's what very, a beautiful woman. Well, yes, Catherine is stunning. Nutmeg had to go under the knife to look like what she looks like today. So, yes, she aspired to look good. Catherine did not. For Catherine, it's all natural. There's not enough common ground between the two of them uh, other than like very superficial characteristics. They are completely different people uh, to the point where it, it's like, like night and day, as I say, night and day. There, there is so little common ground. But then again, 
there's so little common ground between William and Harry these exactly. days. Exactly, and they both grew up in the same environment, and they're completely. And just just to close, just to close. I know we've been mm -hmm. here an hour, but um, do you think that there's a part of Harry that regrets what he's done so far? Do you think he's going to ride and die with this? I think Harry absolutely regrets the outcome. I think that. Oh, the outcome. Cool. Okay. But do I think he regrets his actions? Probably not yet. I think the time will come when he does. One of these days, the damage he has inflicted on people who loved him will dawn on him. It has to. If it doesn't, somebody will point it out to him. But the outcome, oh yes, I think he absolutely regrets where he is at this point in time. But not not the actions that, that led him to that. Right, right. Oh my God, it's you're so spot on, Sue. <gasps> it's, well, it's like, you know, a child. They get caught with their hand in the cookie jar. They're very, very, very sorry they got caught, but they're not one bit sorry they stole that cookie. And I think the I time will come when he, he will be sorry he stole the cookie. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you for being here, Sue. And hopefully we can have you another time because I, lo I love these interactions. I'm sorry if I interrupted, but it's just no, that. No, 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 no. Interrupt all you please. If, if, I love it. It's like talking to my teacher, you know. I wish, you know, in high school, I hardly, I really regret not paying more attention in high school. I was just too impatient, you know. Um, and in and, and math, I was okay in math. I love math because it was very logical, but literature, ugh. And then years later, when I was I was going through my books, you know that that my mom had kept, and, and I found this poetry book by Rubén Darío, an amazing writer, Nicaraguan writer. And I started reading the book, and I'm like, oh my god, it's actually beautiful. I started crying. It's like I can't believe I hated this when I was in school, you know. So talking to you is like, my goodness, I love it, you know. And and I'm very thankful that you take the time to come here and educate us. <laughs> well, that, dear, that is so sweet of you. As I say, I love being able to do this because we can explore all kinds of nooks and crannies in these situations. We can get involved in speculative ventures. When we look at this and say, well, what if, what if Harry had married the right woman? What yeah. if things had turned out? It gives us a great opportunity. Anyway, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this very much. And oh, this is not going to be the last time I'm going to nag you until you come back, you know? No, no, I'm very much looking forward to <laughs> And where to is Audi? I haven't the seen the yet. star of the show. Well, you can look at my star over there. She's like, I'm Audie crazy. is in the front window. It's uh, okay. Quick Audie story. <laughs> I had to go out early this morning to the pharmacy to fill a couple of prescriptions. I let Audie out when I first get up in the morning, but because it was sunny, he didn't want to come oh. back in. So I said, fine, stay out. You're going to have to be here until I come back. So I come back an hour later and there is the cat screeching at me because I've left him outside. So now he's sleeping in a sunny spot. And How dare you? How dare you? He, he doesn't want to have anything to do with me because I left him out for a while, but he'll get over it once he's had his nap and he slept in sunshine. Then it's all going to be forgiven and forgotten. And he's going to, he's going to be my friend again. But for uh, the I moment, so. no, no, he doesn't want anything to do with me. Well, I can, I can understand. How dare you? How dare you, Sue? <laughs> I know. <laughs> he, oh, but here, this is my little Audi pin. Do I have this on? Oh, wow. That's really pretty. Someone from our channel community made this for me. Uh, in fact, I have two of them. I have a little pair of these Audi oh. pins. And yes, so this is my Audi pin. But so I tried to wear yellow, by the way, because I saw your video that you're wearing oh, yellow yes, for you. Catherine. But oh, I yes. don't have anything yellow. I only have other colors. But I'm actually, you know what? I'm going to follow your lead. And I urge people to wear yellow to support Princess Catherine to bring something happy to her life. This came from one of our viewers who had okay. suggested this in what was uh, an exchange in the comments. We somehow got from spring colors 
to wearing yellow for Catherine, and I don't remember how. It was a back and forth. So yes, wearing yellow for Catherine, just as a show of support. Oh, I will do. I try to look for something yellow, but I really don't, and I didn't have that. And everything is closed here, so this is why I couldn't go to buy a shirt or something, you know. But I will. I will actually do that tomorrow. The shops should be open. But thank you very much for coming here, Sue. Well, and I will so make sure that I, I I harass you if possible. I'm gonna be a Megan. I'm gonna be stalking you. I'm gonna be like like crazy with you. There's you know? no need for that. We'll just set something up, and we'll choose a different topic, and we'll do this again. Thanks so very much for coming, Sue. You're so welcome. <laughs> All right, see you next time. Bye-bye, Sidney. -bye,